All right, well, amen. Good morning. Would you stand to your feet, everyone? How many are excited to be back in God's house this morning? Let me get myself plugged in here. Yeah, y'all go ahead and give God praise. Y'all go ahead and give God a hand clap of praise. We are excited to have you all here this morning. Can we just lift our hands right now? And we're just going to welcome the Holy Spirit. We're going to welcome God to come and do whatever God wants to do. Lord, this is your house. We are your children. And God, it is our honor and our privilege to give you praise. Lord, that we say that this is your house, we are your children, and it's an honor, again, to give you praise. And Lord, I'm going to keep saying that again until somebody says it with me. This is your house, this is your ch- we are your children, and it is an honor, God, to give you praise. There's joy in your house this morning, God. There's peace in your house this morning. There's praise in your house this morning, God, and we are thrilled and honored to be here. We're thrilled and honored to be in your presence. And Lord, we exalt you, we lift you up, we glorify you, we magnify your name. We say, God, have your way, do whatever you want to do Lord Lord we just bless you God we exalt you we give you the glory and the honor and the praise that you so richly deserve Lord beside you there is no other you alone are God so we give you everything we can this morning God we lay ourselves on the altar Lord and we say consume us with your fire consume us with your presence we want to leave your change never the same Lord Jesus can I get somebody to give the Lord praise in this house can I give somebody to give the Lord honor in this house for he is good We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. How God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Because He hung up on that cross. Then He rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Because we were the beggars. And now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord see me. Come on, church, lift it up. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord see me raise. We were, we were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord see break. Come on, there's joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our 
God is shining in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. No, oh Lord, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. There is joy in this house, Lord. All because of you. All because of what you've done. And what you're going to do. Hallelujah, we praise you, Jesus. We sing praises to your name, Lord. Let praise be our weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. Yes, it does. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let it Arise. We'll say, we'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lifted high. With all creation, cry, God, we praise you. Oh. oh, oh. the raging sea let faith be the song that calms that storm inside of me let it rise let faith arise I'll sing that again let faith be let faith be the song that calms the storm the raging sea let faith be the song that calms that storm inside of me let it rise Rise, let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. So forever lift him high. With all creation, cry God. Come on, church, declare. We'll see you break. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation, cry God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. How many believe your praise is a weapon this morning? How many believe the Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and also by the word of our testimony? What He's done for me what He's doing in my life and what I know He's going to do in my life. I've got endless reasons to praise Him. I've got endless reasons to lift Him up. I've got endless reasons to glorify Him. In every circumstance, I declare the name of Jesus. In every circumstance, I declare my God is still God. In every circumstance, I declare that He is still my provider, that He is still my deliverer, that He is still the apple of my eye, that He is still the victory in my life, that He is still the one who calms storms. He's still the one who makes a way where there is no way. And when we do that, when we declare those things, we're joining with the heavens. We're joining with the angels. And we're declaring who He is and what He's capable of and what He can do for us and what He can do in us. So let's sing this together. This is what heaven, this is what living looks like. 
This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Come on. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creations, my God, we praise you.
spirit strong in me. My flesh may fail, my God, you never will. So I may be weak, yeah. your spirit strong in me. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I This is the air I breathe. Oh, this is the air I breathe. Your holy presence is living in me. This is. This is my daily bread. You're the
I just want you to close your eyes with me for a second. No one's looking around. You're able to really focus on the Lord. Imagine him standing in front of you. And you have your ear with him for a few moments. Would you tell him that you're desperate for him? Do you have that really in your heart that you really just long for his presence and you can't be without him? So just picture him forehead to forehead with you and you just get to whisper something to him. Let's whisper this together to the Lord. Face to face. And I Desperate for you. And I, I'm lost without you. Again. And I. God, it's as simple as that. I'd be lost without you. There would be no hope for me. There would be no restoration for me. There'd be no joy in my life. There'd be no peace in my life. There'd be no true love in my life. I would be lost without you. This is what David meant when he prayed, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Don't ever let me get to a place again in my life where I forget without you I am nothing. Without you I am nothing. Every good and perfect thing comes from him everything in my life I can hold claim to and say this has been good to me or this is good for me it's always been from him Paul said it this way if I could ascribe my righteousness value the things I can do on my own if I could ascribe value to that it would be filthy rags compared to this one thing knowing Christ because without him I'm nothing but with him I can do all things. Can we just take a moment right now and just thank Him? Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Maybe you're here this morning or watching online right now, and you can't say that yet. You are still lost without Him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we don't have to wait till the end of the service to do this. If you're here this morning in this room or watching online right now, if you're watching online, just put the, put the hand lifted up emoji when I ask this question. If you need Jesus to find you, if you need Jesus to find you, redeem you, save you from your sin, bring you close to God, give you your identity, save you to where you're no longer lost. You no longer have no hope. You no longer have no peace. You no longer have no joy. You find him. He finds you. And you find everything that comes with him. If that's you this morning, under the sound of my voice, here or online, just slip up your hand wherever you are. Wherever you are. Hallelujah. 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 If you're online, put up the, put the hands up emoji. We're going to pray for you. Lord Jesus, we're honored and privileged that we can know you. You said if we, if we lift you up, that you would draw us to you. So Lord, we draw near to you right now so you can draw near to us. 
And Lord, we ask you right now in Jesus' name for all those who lifted their hands and all those online that are watching who lifted their hands, that God, right here and now, you would make yourself so real to them to where they can know beyond a shadow of a doubt they're no longer lost. May they invite you into their hearts. Save them from their sins. Make you Lord and Savior of their life. And from this moment forward, they live for you. That's all you have to pray. Just pray those simple things. Lord, save me from my sin. Forgive me of all my sin that separated me from from the Father. Redeem me. Bring me close to you. Save me. Be Lord of my life. And from this day forward, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to do what your word says. I'm going to spend time with you every day. I want to be more like you, Jesus, because when I act like me, I don't have any hope. When I act like me, I don't have joy. When I act like me, I'm not, I'm not loved. When I act like you, I have everything. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer right now. I want to say thank you to God for everybody he's been doing great things in. I got a chance to attend the funeral of Brother Larry Harrison this past Wednesday. Sister Sharon is in very good spirits. There she is this morning. God bless you. Can we give her a hand clap? We thank you so much, my sister. We love you. We love your family. So glad to see you this morning. Continued prayers for you, for all those who need it. The greatest thing about being found in Jesus is that you're forever found. So he may not be breathing in this earth anymore, but he is leaping and praising God on the streets of gold. And he is breathing and living the greatest life he could ever live in the presence of God now. Paul said to live is Christ, to die is gain, because I get to go home, and he is home. That's one of the greatest parts about being found in Jesus, is you're forever home. So we thank God for that, but I want to pray continually for all those who need to find Jesus. God is healing different people in our campuses. We've had people getting healed. We had over 60 some odd people give their heart to Christ over the last week in our, in our resurrection services. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Several rededications. We baptized over 30 people across all three campuses. So many people gave their hearts to the Lord. So many people came and brought people to church with them. A lot of you are here for the first or second time because of last week. And I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege to have you here. I want to continue to pray uh, for the hat makers, Brother Ed and Sister Ernie. Their daughter is giving birth to twins. They think that she may have the babies today. So we're going to pray for God to just overshadow them right now. How many believe that, what, that the greatest deliverer is sometimes in the waiting room? Amen. And Jesus can deliver those babies with peace and with calmness and comfort. And he can give strength to that mother and strength to that family. And if you're here this morning, would you bow your heads with me? If you're here this morning and you have an unspoken need that you want us to pray about, would you just lift that up right now? Just lift up your hand right now. Pastor David, I have a prayer request I want to lift up in prayer right now in this atmosphere. There's one. I think I see two. There's three. Good, good. You don't have to say anything out loud. God knows your heart. God knows your mind. The Bible says cast your cares on him. He cares for you. Don't hold those things close to your heart. Throw them in the hands of Jesus. Throw them in the hands of the one who can do something about it. So right now, Lord, we lift up all these needs to you. Lord, we lift up everyone right now that gave their heart to Jesus last week. We pray right now, Lord, and those who gave their heart to him this morning. I ask right now, Jesus, Lord, you would draw them so close to you. That, Lord, the world can no longer claim them. The enemy can no longer claim them. They now belong to you. They're part of the family. So, Lord Jesus, I pray you would overshadow them with your love, your joy, and your peace. And put them, Lord, in a place where they can be discipled, where they can be mentored. To learn about you, learn how to pray, and learn how to read your word. Learn how to grow up in you so they can mature in their faith. And, Lord, so the enemy and the ways of this world cannot recapture their hearts. But they're forever a part of you and forever part of the family, Lord Jesus. Lord, we lift up the hat makers right now in Jesus' name. And I pray, God, that you would just be in that room. Holy Spirit, would you guide the hands of all the, of all the doctors, of all the nurses, of all the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the people doing uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the procedures, God? Lord, I'm having trouble talking, but Lord, you know what I'm trying to say. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would bring peace and comfort to that young lady. That, Lord, in Jesus' name, you would give strength to her body that is supernatural. That, Lord, I pray for healthy births for both of these babies. I pray for health for the mother. I pray for peace, comfort, and joy for the entire family. Lord, you have this situation in your hands, and God, you know what needs to be done and what way it needs to be done, and Lord, we entrust it to you. And we're believing for an amazing report in Jesus' name for all this. 
that you're doing. And Lord, right now, I lift up every request that was lifted up of the hands this morning, and maybe those watching online that may also have unspoken. Lord, you said for us to pray that your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So right now, Lord, I pray in every one of these situations that your kingdom would come and your will would be done, that heaven and earth would become one in every situation, God. So Lord, bring healing in Jesus' name. Bring freedom in Jesus' name. Bring rest in Jesus' name. Bring peace and comfort in Jesus' name. I pray right now under the sound of my voice, somebody is here with one of the things you're praying for is for peace in your life. The Bible says God gives you peace that goes beyond your understanding. You can't manufacture it in your mind. You can't make peace happen. You've got to give your worries to God and let God give you His peace. Let God give you His peace to where, yeah, I don't understand why I'm going through this. I don't understand where all this is coming from. But God, but I trust God in the midst of this storm, I choose to have peace. So right now in Jesus' name, I pray peace over whoever that is right now. The word of the Lord to you is peace and He is your Prince of Peace. He delivers your peace. He gives you peace. So right now in Jesus' name, Lord, for every unspoken request, God, have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way, God. Move in power. Move in authority. Move by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, God, in advance, believing by faith that you keep your word. That you who began the work will be faithful to its completion. For not only are you the Alpha God, you're the Omega. You're the beginning and the end. You hold all things in your hands, Jesus. We worship you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And if you believe all that, what do you say? Amen, amen. As you're seated this morning, would you turn to your neighbor, give a fist bunk, a hug, or a high five, and say, hey, God's got this. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to welcome all of you to uh, Refuge Church West. Aren't you glad you came to be in God's house this morning? Amen. The Bible says we are the house of God and we are the gate of heaven, but there's something about coming together with our brothers and sisters and worshiping God together. I'm thankful for my prayer closet. I'm thankful for when I get to praise and be with God alone, but there's something about when I get to praise Him and pray with all of you. It's such a blessing. It's such an encouraging thing to be a part of the family of God. If you're here this morning and you're brand new, maybe it's your first time, on the back of the pew in front of you, there's a red card that looks like this. In just a minute, I want you to take that card and fill it out, as much information as you're willing to give us. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that information, we're going to put it into a database, and that way you get a subscription of People Magazine every single month. No, that's not what's going to happen. But what that is going to do is it's going to give us a chance to just reach out to you and say thank you for being here, and thank you for spending your weekend, part of your weekend with us. And we want to make you aware of everything that's coming up. And the way we do that is we have your information so we can email you, give you a text message or a phone call, whatever, just to say, hey, this is coming, or hey, we missed you if you happen to be out one Sunday. How many are thankful this morning that as the body of Christ, we can stay connected to each other? You can't do this thing alone. If you try to separate a part of your body, if I took a rubber band and put it around my pinky and made it so tight that, it no lo- that the blood flow was no longer connected, what happens? It shrivels up and dies. So there's nothing wrong with your personal walk with Christ, but how many believe we need each other? We, the body needs itself, and so we need, we need to connect together and be together. So we want to thank you for being here and being connected to us, and we want to connect more with you. At this time, uh, we're going to move to the next part of our worship, which is our uh, weekly tithe and offering. And uh, there's an envelope on the back of the pew in front of you. You can take this if you have a physical check or cash or, or um, uh, whatever you have. And if you want to put it in there on the back of the do- uh, room, on your way out the door, on your right, there's a black box on the wall. That's where all the offering can be dropped off at. If you want to give online, there's a, car- a QR code in your bulletin that you got when you walked in today. You can scan that with your phone. It'll take you directly to the give page uh, for our church. Make sure you're on the Refuge Church West page when you give. Or if you don't, uh, not tech savvy to scan it with your camera, that's fine. You can just go to refugechurchag.com in your browser. Those of you watching online right now, take a screenshot of that code that's on your screen. And then after you take a screenshot of it and it's a picture, you can tap on it in your photos and you can go to it that way. Everybody's always saying to me, why do y'all put, screen, why do y'all put codes on the screen? Because you can't take your phone out and scan the code if you're watching on your phone. That's how you do it. And, I, and I'll be honest, I'm 39 years old. I'm a millennial. I learned that last month. So you can teach this old dog a few new tricks. If you have a QR code on your screen, if you're watching something and a code comes on the screen, if you take a screenshot of it and and collect the picture after that, 
you can use the code to go to wherever the code's taking you. So that's really, really cool. But if you want to give online, there's the two ways you can give online. But I want to say thank you to all of you for being here this morning at Refuge Church West. At this time, please look to the screen, and we're going to tell you, show you this morning's video announcements. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the West Campus of Refuge Church. We're so excited that you chose to come today and spend part of your weekend with us. Before we transition to today's message and what God wants us to know in His Word, here are a few upcoming events for everyone to mark in your calendars. Two weeks from today on Sunday, April 21st is Grow Group Sunday. We love this fun lunchtime and we love building friendships together. This month, we are encouraging everyone to bring their favorite family dish or dessert that everyone loves to eat. So join us immediately after the morning service on April 21st for Grow Group and invite someone to come with you. On Saturday, April 27th, all of our Refuge Kids Ministries will be coming together for a fun game day. If you have a child between the ages of 5 and 12, this will be an event that they will definitely want to be at. The game day fun starts at 2 p.m. at the Central Campus and ends at 4 p.m. Please see Pastor Samantha if you have any questions. Refuge Seniors, coming up this Saturday, April 13th, we will be having our spring fling at the Central Campus. We're going to be serving chicken and dressing, sweet potato casserole, green beans, salad, and rolls. We will also be having a special time of music with Mark Taylor and his bluegrass band. So come join us at 11 a.m. in the Smack this Saturday for our spring fling. Be sure to stay connected throughout the week at Refuge Church West on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our podcast on your favorite listening platform. Thank you so much for being with us today at Refuge Church West. We pray you have a blessed day and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Amen, amen. Thank you so much to my beautiful wife. That's her voice. And now you know why I'm married to her, because I get to listen to that every day. And nobody said, aww, <laughs> but that's okay. I know, we do love her. Not as much as me, but y'all do love her. Uh, I'm just so thrilled again to have each and every one of you. A couple of quick announcements. We don't, I couldn't put all the videos in there or all the announcements in there because I don't want to overwhelm you guys, but there are two quick announcements. If you open your bulletin, you'll see them. Uh, the first is every Sunday we meet for prayer here at 8.30. So if you ever want to come early before church uh, to, to meet us with prayer, uh, we encourage you to do so. Also, this coming Saturday will be our very first Saturday prayer. Now, normally we're going to do this at 830, but this coming Saturday we have to do it because of a schedule conflict. We have to do it at 730. So this is a litmus test to see how much you truly love God. Who, If you're willing to get up and be here at 730, I'm just kidding. It is not mandatory. We do not, we're not going to make anybody, I'm not going to call each and every one of you at 6.15 and go, get out of bed, get out of bed, get out, I'm not going to do that. Funny story, uh, Brother Mark Lowry was always invited to, he's a comedian, if you don't know who that is, he was always invited to prayer times, and he got tired of the text messages, and he got tired of the phone calls, so he named his bed The Word. So whenever people would call him, he'd go, I can't talk right now because I'm in The Word. <laughs> don't you dare do that. Don't you dare do that, but for him it worked. But I just want to say, if you, if you would love to join me in prayer this coming Saturday, I'm fully okay with being the only person here, but I want to encourage you to join us. There's something about when God's people pray together. If any of you missed this past Wednesday, we had our first soak service, which was going to happen every single first Wednesday of the month. And if you were here, you can attest. We encountered God on Wednesday night. It was a powerful time of prayer and worship to God. And so when next month comes around and you see that soap graphic on the screen, please join us on Wednesday for that. We have Wednesday service this coming Wednesday as well. We're going to start a new series of teaching and going into the Word on Wednesday nights this coming Wednesday. So we encourage you to help us and be a part of that. Also, the last thing is, as you all got to experience this morning, uh, my wife is... Uh, doing an amazing thing, which is our breakfast last Sunday was such a hit. Everybody enjoyed it so much. We're going to keep it going, but I'm not going to make my wife cook every single week. So guess what? I need you guys to help. So immediately following the service back in the fellowship hall, if you did not see it already, there's a sign up sheet and all you're going to do, we're going to, we're going to provide a lot of like the granola bars and the pop tarts and the coffee and all of that stuff. We will take care of that. It's anything that you want to make. If you want to make scrambled eggs and bacon, if you want to make biscuits and gravy, 
TV, if you want to make cinnamon rolls, anything you want to make just to add one extra thing to the brunch and, or to the breakfast, excuse me. And then if you want to bring some fruit, things like that alongside of it. But we don't want to make anybody overwhelmed with this because I know we have Grow Group Sundays as well once a month. But again, if you get on the rotation, the more people that sign up for it, the longer you go in between times. So you might do it every month or you, if we have enough people sign up, you might do it every three months. But the important thing is there's a rotation going because how many enjoyed coming in, smelling food and being able to sit down and talk to each other, drink coffee? That's what we want here because we're not just a church that comes together. We're family. Can I please say that again? Here at Refuge Church West, we're family. And there's something about when you come together with family and you eat breakfast together and you say, hey, how was your week? What, what's God doing in your life? Or, man, hey, I came last Sunday and we prayed about this and God did this. Hey, pass the gravy, please. And you just get that chance. It's just so odd. It's like a breakfast table, the family coming together because I want this campus to be even more than just a bunch of individuals who see each other once a week. When, when you're here like the Olive Garden, you're family. Because that's who we are. We're the family of God. We are the body of Christ. We, we all have our individual walks with God, but we're also connected and we are family. So please make sure you sign up if you want to be a part of that in the, in the back. I appreciate you doing that. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you please go with me? And uh, we're going to tackle a couple of different uh, passages today. The first one we're going to go to is 1 Thessalonians 5. And then the second one we're going to go to is Jeremiah chapter 33. We're starting a new series today. And everybody say, Yay! Because for three months, y'all been in the Best Life Ever series. And how many, all right, just be honest with me. How many of you got at least something out of the last three months? How many? Okay, then praise God I obeyed. <laughs> because otherwise, if nobody raised their hands, I'd been like, oh, great. What am I going to do with this one? No, but I'm just so thankful that God has been doing that. The word best, you'll continue to hear that out of my mouth all year long because that is our word for this year, best. Because we do want what God has for us. We do want God's best for us. But this morning, we're going to start a new series for the month of April called No Limits. Everybody say, No Limits. Unlocking your full potential in Christ. How many believe that sometimes in this life we forget who we are? And sometimes walking through this life we forget just how much God has placed inside of us. Just how much God wants to do in us and all, and even more how much God wants to do through us. You have so much potential inside of you. And the Lord wants to speak to you over the next four weeks and say, in certain areas of your life, God wants no limits. Everybody say, no limits. In my life, there should be no limits. In my life with Christ, there should be no limits. Now, real quick, I want to say there's some areas of our lives where you do need to put guards up and you do need to put limits on yourself. For me, it's food. If I could install a shocker on my refrigerator door, I would. That's only attuned to my hands because I don't want my kids to get shocked. But that every time I walk up to the fridge and it's not my window of eating, I'm reminded immediately, get away from the fridge. Because food is a vice for me. I, and it's not that I'm addicted to it. I just love how food tastes. Is anybody else that way too? It's just simply the truth. When I get depressed, I don't usually turn to food. Matter of fact, when I get depressed, I usually don't eat. But I love the taste of food, and so sometimes I need to put a guard on myself when it comes to food. How about we need to put a guard on ourselves when it comes to our tempers? James said it this way, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. So we need to guard our tempers. How many of you understand we need to put guards on our eyes? Job said it this way, I will put nothing evil before my eyes. I want, and the, Paul said it this way, I will flee from my youthful lust. I'll free, flee from those things that used to trip me up. So there are areas of our lives we need to put guards on. Otherwise, the enemy or our flesh will do damage. However, in some areas, we tend to put limits on ourselves that God never intended us to do so. Some areas of your life, you might, do, you might take an assessment as these messages go on and realize, wait a second, I put guardrails on that part of my life and God never intended me to do that. Whenever I think about this, I think about going bowling. How many, do we get, any people love to go bowling in the room? No? Okay, just me. I like going bowling with my family because I'm not good at it. I get to have fun. I get to have fun and just be bad at something. And it, it's, it's so much fun to do that. But it's fun when we bowl with the kids, we put the guards up. And of course, I still bowl with the guards up. No more gutters for me. And so it's just so much, when I think about putting guards up, I think about that. But if, how, many, how many know, if you want to become a good bowler, eventually you've got to put the guards down. 
And you've got to learn how to aim it better and how to spin it right, how to get the right speed and all those things so you can do damage to those pins and not worry about the gutters because you've been practicing with the guards down. In the same way, in your walk with Christ, God is not wanting you to forever bowl like a kid. God wants you to learn how to bowl like a pro, and sometimes that means you've got to learn when it's time to put those guards down and start working on unlocking your full potential in Him. Can I get an amen? Whether it's due to our insecurities, our past, or the way we view things, or maybe pressures from other people, all of us potentially and probably have at least one area in our lives that God wants there to be no limits. And this morning, the first area I want to talk to you about is God wants no limits to your prayer. God wants no limits to our prayer. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, I just thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that everything you're going to speak this morning is truth and it is life. So, Lord, I pray right now you'd move me out of the way and move all my opinion out of the way and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Let your word go forth and accomplish what it's meant to go forth and accomplish and let it not come back empty because you said and you promised that it wouldn't. But let the seed be sown on good soil. Right now, under the sound of my voice and everybody watching online, Lord, I pray that the soil of their hearts be made fertile and be made ready to receive the, the seed that you want me to throw out there with your hands right now. Let it produce Produce so much fruit in their lives, God, and let it produce so much in their prayer closet. I ask all this in Jesus' name. And if you believe that and want that, what do you say? Amen. amen and amen. No limits to our prayer. Webster's Dictionary defines prayer as making a request to God with humility, addressing God with adoration, confession, supplication, or thanksgiving. So in essence, prayer is how we communicate with God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is how we communicate with God. Because how many understand and believe God wants us to communicate with Him because God is always communicating with us? In case you're, in case you're new to the faith this morning, I wanted to tell you something very, very powerful. Your God is a speaking God. You have the only God in this entire universe that actually speaks, that actually is verbal. When the very beginning of time, the Bible records and says, and the Lord said, let there be. One of the first verses in the whole Bible is the Lord said, God talked. In the same way, God has never changed. God is a speaking God. And therefore, we, because God is speaking to us, God desires for us to communicate back to Him. And the way we do that is through a word called prayer. As simple as that sounds, there's a reason the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Because as they lived a life with Jesus and they saw that all that he, Jesus said and everything that Jesus did, they realized that his prayer life was the foundation for everything he did. How many of you enjoy the series right now, The Chosen? If you're not watching it, I encourage you to. The Chosen will blow your mind. Now, don't watch it in place of the Bible. But watch it with the Bible close to you so you can see the parallels and you can see the Bible come to life. But what I love about The Chosen is it makes Jesus so relatable and it makes Jesus understandable because sometimes because of media or because of the way people have portrayed Jesus, sometimes Jesus appears as this unattainable person. Jesus appears as this unrealistic person that all of us are dirty and grungy and need to watch our tongues and watch our mouths and we're struggling through life. And here's Jesus walking on the water and walking through the earth. And hey, Lord, bless you. And blessed are the meek and blessed are the poor. And when they whipped him, all oh, that hurt and all oh, that hurt. And that's not my Jesus. My Jesus was 100% God. But he was also 100% man. My Jesus lived life. My Jesus laid aside his godliness, laid aside his omnipotence, laid aside his omniscience, all power and all knowledge, laid, laid aside his omnipresence to be everywhere at once. He laid all that aside and came to earth vulnerable, came to earth with limitations, came to earth not knowing everything, came to earth not being able to do everything, came to earth not being able to teleport across the cosmos like he used to. He came and embodied a human body and walked in a human body. Why? So we could do it too. 
He came and walked among this life and he had struggles. He got hungry. He got tired. He got weary. He needed to pray. Please hear me on that. Your Lord and Savior, as he walked the earth for 33 years, needed to pray. Because he had to go through every day ministering to people and speaking to people and recording those red letters that we read about him. And as he did those things, he did not know everything. Anytime Jesus asks a question in the scripture, a lot of times it's rhetorical. But a lot of times Jesus did not have an answer yet. Let me give you an example. When the woman with the issue of blood grabbed his garment and he, she was instantly healed. And he said, who touched me? And the disciples say, Master, you're being crowded on all sides. Everyone touched you. He said, no, no, no. Someone touched me. Strength just left me. He doesn't ask that going, I know who that is. Hey, you back there. I see you. I got eyes right here. I see you. That's not what he did. He literally looked around and said, who just touched me? Why? Because he didn't know. He needed God to reveal it. And thankfully, the woman spoke up and said, it was me. But that's who Jesus was. Very rarely in the scripture will you see where the Bible says, and Jesus knew what they were thinking. How did he know? Holy Spirit told him. Because the Bible says that Jesus said these words, I only do what the Father tells me to do. And I only do what the Father tell, I only say what the Father tells me to say. And how does the Father communicate with the Son? The same way God communicates with us through the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, because I've done this, because I've lived this life, so can you. And Jesus said a lot of times would withdraw himself at night and he would pray for a while or sometimes he would pray all night long. If you read the book of Luke, the Bible says Jesus withdrew and spent an entire night praying to God. And the next morning he chose his twelve. So what does that tell me, Pastor? What, is that, what are you trying to say, Pastor David? Before Jesus made one of the biggest decisions of his life, he got before God and consulted God and said, God, who are the 12? All these people follow me. All these 70, these, these thousands, these hundreds, they follow me on a daily basis. I know who I think I need to put in the group. I know who I might want to put in the group. But God, who are the 12? And the Lord, and he got along with God and he began to pray. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, Simon who you will call Peter. Pick his brother Andrew. Pick the two numbskulls, the sons of thunder, James and John. And he began praying, and the Lord spoke to him and said, these are your twelve. Now here's the mind-blowing part. Jesus also picked Judas who would betray him. And I dare to say, and if you, if, you don't, if you don't want to ascribe to this theory, I completely understand you are entitled to walk out your own salvation with God. But because of what I just said and how Jesus walked this life, I firmly believe with every fiber of my being because there's a reason Jesus had to feel what it was like to be betrayed. I firmly believe with all my heart that until the Last Supper, he did not know who would do it. I firmly believe with all my heart that three years Judas walked with him. Jesus did not know until that evening he would be betrayed by Judas. And here's the other thing. I don't think Jesus knew how he would do it. That's why Jesus asked that question. So you do it with a kiss, brother? That's how you want to do it? You don't come up and hit me? You don't come up and slap me. You don't come up and point at me. You come up and embrace me as a friend, kiss me on the cheek to tell them it's me. How dare you? That's betrayal. That's who Jesus was. So I firmly believe with all my heart, if you read the Bible that way, thinking whatever Jesus says, the Holy Spirit told him, or whatever Jesus knew, the Holy Spirit let him know, it blows your mind when you read it because then all of a sudden you understand and realize if Jesus can do it, I can do it. I can walk in the Spirit. I can walk through life and God tell me things. I can walk through life and only speak what I hear Jesus saying. I can walk through life and only speak what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. But how was Jesus able to live this way? Prayer. He spent time with God. He spent time taking off those limits because he had limits in his body. He couldn't be everywhere at once. He couldn't just do things miraculously anymore. He couldn't know everything. He had limitations. So what did he do to get along with God and expand and take the limits off of himself? He spent time in prayer. Are you with me so far? 
In the same way, that's the template for us. And so we need to learn to remove the limitations in our prayer life. Why? So God can use us to the full potential he wants to use us. So the first way I want to talk to you about this is this. The first blank on the back of your bulletin where you're taking notes. The Bible says that, the, that God wants no limits to when we pray. Everybody say, it don't matter when. It doesn't matter when. There's no limits to when we pray. You see, because God lives outside the limits and parameters of what we call time. The rotation of our earth, which gives us day and night. The tilting of our earth and the distance it is from the sun at different times in the year, which gives us our seasons. And the revolution of the earth all the way around the sun one time, which gives us what we call a year. God exists above all of this. God is not measured by time. God cannot be altered by time. And matter of fact, in the scripture, if you read it, God has stopped time more than once because God exists outside of time. Time is something we created to measure, time, to measure days, months, weeks, years, hours, minutes, seconds. We came up with time. God lives above that. God put it this way to Isaiah. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are greater than your ways. What you call time, I exist above that. Because God is eternal. So God sees the end from the beginning in one glance. And I know that's hard for us to, to think about in our temporal finite minds. But if you really think about it, in one glance of God's eyes, He sees the end from the beginning. God does not see chapters. God does not see beginning and endings. God sees all of time in one look. Which is why sin breaks his heart so much. Because in God's eyes, he still sees the cross. Because he, 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 that wasn't yesterday to him. That's still happening. It's still present to him. Because God isn't measured or looks at things in time. God looks at all of it in one moment. So God doesn't use time restraints when it comes to prayer. Nor does God require us to use measurements of time when we measure our prayer life. And this is, a, this, if you are religious this morning, you're about to be very upset with me, but I just want to go ahead and put a disclaimer out there for everybody here and everybody watching online. At Refuge Church West, I am anti-religion because my God is anti-religion. Religion has no place in this house. Religion is what put Jesus on the cross. We don't come to church to be religious. We come to church to get to know Him. Are you with me today? Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's a church. It's a family. I don't, govern my, I don't govern my family in religion. I govern my family on we get to know each other and we do life together. That's what God intended for us to do. God didn't send Jesus to establish a new religion. God sent Jesus to undo all the wrong ones. Are you here this morning? But God does not care the amount of time you pray. If you pray one minute in the morning before, as you're getting ready, but man, you give God that whole minute and God speaks to you, then good, you gave God a minute. And guess what happens when you do that? You want to give Him five more. And then you want to give Him ten more. And then you want to give Him thirty. And then you want to give Him an hour. And the more time you spend with God and the more time you and God spend time together. How many of you have been at someone's house that you just love spending time with them and you didn't want to go home? Everybody that comes to my house, that's how everybody tells me they feel. But that's the way God is. The more time you spend with Him, the more time you want to spend with Him. So God isn't measuring how much time you spent with Him and said, well, if you just give me one more minute, you would have had a better day. That's not God. God doesn't judge you based on amount of time. God judges you, God judges you based on heart of time. Are you with me today? And Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Here we go. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. So what is Paul saying here? It doesn't say give, rejoice one hour a day. It doesn't say pray this much a day. It doesn't say give thanks this time in your life. God removes all of that stuff and says always. So whenever you need to rejoice, rejoice. Whenever you need to pray, pray. Whenever you need to give thanks, give thanks. I am not judging you or measuring you. There is no time card with me. You don't clock in and clock out with God. You're on an eternal walk with Him. Are you hearing me? 
You are always in His eye. You're always walking with Him. You're always before Him. So God doesn't all of a sudden go, okay, they clocked out. I'm going to turn my attention over to this person. No, the Bible says I'm the apple of His eye. He's always watching me. He's always moving with me. The Holy Spirit is not limited by space or by time. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent, which means He's everywhere. So as the Holy Spirit walks with you every day in your life, He also walks with me every day in my life, and He walks with Sister, with Sister Amber every day in her life, and He walks with my son Nate every day in his life, and my wife Jessica, and our kids in the back. He's not limited. There's 7 billion plus people on this planet, and the Holy Spirit said, easy peasy, I can walk with all of you. Because I'm not limited. So you don't clock in and clock out and the Holy Spirit goes, oh, great. I can only handle 6.5 billion today. I'm glad they're taking, giving me a break. That's not the way he works. He's always working. He's always moving. He's always talking. He's always wanting more and more time with you. So that's why it says always. It is possible to live a life that is in continuous communication with God. And the more you practice this lifestyle the more natural it will be to you. How many understand the Christian life is not something you just get it on day one? I had to learn how to stop saying those things. I had to learn how to put those addictions down. I had to learn how to not read this, but read this. I had to learn how to stop being with these people and start being with these people. I had to learn how I can't go to that place anymore. I've got to start being around these kind of places now. You have to grow and mature because it's a life. You are born into the kingdom of God when you accept Jesus. What does that mean? You're a baby. So I need to be fed. I need to be be protected. I need to be encouraged. We make a bad habit in the church if we we ask you to get saved. And then all of a sudden, we, 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 we assume that a baby can take care of itself in the spirit. And that's not true. Some people, God can mature you overnight. You can become a 10-year-old by the next day. Other people need a little help. Teach me to pray. Teach me where should I start in the Bible. Hey, Pastor David, I was reading this yesterday. What does this mean? Hey, Pastor David... Is it important to be at church every single Sunday? What if I have to work? And people ask you these questions, and if you get all religious, well, of course you should be at church every Sunday. Quit your job. Of course you should read the entire New Testament by next Sunday. There'll be a quiz on this after service. That's why I hate religion, because religion is unrealistic, and religion is not what God uses to gauge life. God uses relationship to gauge life. Are you doing better today with me than you were yesterday? If you're taking one more step further, if you're getting a little bit older in your faith, if the things that used to bother you don't bother you anymore, if the things you used to be having as vices in your life are no longer vices in your life, if the way you used to talk, you don't talk that way anymore, if the way you used to treat people, you don't treat treat people that way anymore, are you growing in Christ a little bit more every day? If you are, then the Bible says that's maturity, that's growing, and that's what God wants. Are you hearing me today? And everybody grows at different places and at different speeds. And that's why Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling before God. Because here's the the common denominator, no matter where we're at in our faith, is we're all answering to the same God. And we're all answering to the same Jesus. So we all have areas of our life that we're going to tremble in. And we all have areas of our life that we need to have the fear of the Lord, which is called the beginning of wisdom. A long time ago, There was a monk named Brother Lawrence, and he wrote a book called The Practice of the Presence of God. I encourage all of you to get this book. It's not very big. He just wrote it while he was in his time in the monastery. And the Lord spoke to him one day and said, I want you to live your life every day as if I'm in the room with you because I am. And so what he did was he literally would try his best to imagine the physical body of Jesus was in the room with him at all times. So much so that when he would eat meals, he would make another plate for Jesus sitting next to him. So much so that when he was reading, he would talk to the chair next to him as if he and Jesus were talking. And of course, all of his brothers in the monastery thought, this dude has been here too long. He's putting too much salt in his fish. He's nuts. But over time, he began to realize, I'm not thinking about those things anymore. I'm not talking like I used to talk. The, the complaining I used to do, I'm not complaining as much anymore. Why? Because I'm beginning to realize I've formed a habit. I've formed a new lifestyle. And now, no matter where I am, I don't have to make that plate of food anymore for him because I just know he's here. 
And I don't have to, I don't have to talk to him like, like I'm crazy. I can just, in my mind or in my spirit, talk to him like he's here. And after a while, he just had a lifestyle completely transformed to where everywhere he was, he practiced the presence of God. And it got to the point where his prayer life had changed so dramatically and his life changed so dramatically that the other monks in the monastery began asking, what did you do? How do you know this scripture better this way? How did you learn how to pray this way? And he said, I practiced. For all of you that are athletes in this room, you don't walk on the field and you're Michael Jordan the first day or you're Bo Jackson the first day or you're Wayne Gretzky on the ice the first day. You've got to practice. You've got to get better. No matter how good you are naturally gifted, if you never practice and improve your skills, you're going to get passed by or you're going to get cut. You have to practice and get better. In the same way with the Christian life, we have to improve day by day by day. And if you stumble and fall, pray for forgiveness, get back up and keep going forward. For though the righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up every time. Are you with me today? So I encourage you, go grab the book and read it. Number two, the Bible says there's no limits to how we pray. Everybody say, how I pray. So not, there's no limits to when I'm supposed to pray. I can pray at all times. And there's no limits to how I pray. I've used the analogy before that when it comes to praying to God, when it comes to when, before we move to the how, real quick, praying with God is like a cell phone. I don't have a constant conversation on my cell phone every day because that would be very rude to the world around me. So in essence, I don't get up and ring God's number, and from the moment I wake up to the moment I go back to sleep, I'm on the phone all day long. Because if someone does this in a waiting room, or waiting on their food, or waiting on their car to get done, I cannot stand people that have loud phone calls. I can't stand it. How many in this room are with me? Uh, we're in a doctor's waiting room, and you're waiting on the doctor to come back and get you. Well, then what we're going to do is I'm going to take the car in and get it detailed, and then i got to get an oil change, and then i got to pick up the kids. And I'm like, we're people in this room too. I can't stand it. It's obnoxious. It's inconsiderate. And the same is true with God. You can be ho- so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. So what does it mean to pray without ceasing, to pray continually? What that means is, I'm going to stay in an area where I always have reception to him. Some of you, your mind just blew. Good. Every time you take your phone out now, I want you to think about this. I'm going to stay in an area of my life, in my spirit, where anytime God rings me or texts me, got it. Got it. Because anytime I need to call or text him, he gets me. He gets me. He's perfect. He never drops a call. Aren't you thankful? I know sometimes it may feel like he's not answering the phone, but he sees the call. He just wants to, he wants you to trust him until he calls back. But stay in an area where you always get his call. Stay in an area where you always get his text message. There's nothing more terrifying than to be stranded in a place with no reception. And how many know in this life, That's terrifying with God. I've been in places in my life where I can't hear him. I've been in places in my life where I let the wrong things come in and they choke out the volume and they choke out the noise and now I hear all the other voices and I can't hear his. And that's a scary place to be. We need to stay in a place of reception with God where we always hear him and we always have reception to hear him when he speaks. Are you with me this morning? But no limits to how we pray. Everyone, when you hear the word prayer, you probably have in your mind the voice of a person praying that maybe you learned from or you've heard them pray many, many times. And when you hear the word prayer, you hear that person praying. I hear my papa praying. Me and Brother Joe were talking this morning about my papa's podcast that I'm doing where I'm I'm taking all of his old sermons from when he was a pastor and I'm converting them into digital. And just a shameless plug, isn't he wonderful? On YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, not Instagram, on uh, YouTube, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get podcasts or YouTube, uh, you go listen to Isn't He Wonderful, my Papa Henry Melton's messages. Today's message is, it's a wonderful life. Talks about a life with Christ being the wonderful life. It's a really, really good message. I enjoyed listening to that one. But whenever I hear the word prayer, I think about the way my Papa would pray. 
I think about the way my dad would pray, my mom would pray. And I think about people in my life that would pray that would make me flat out laugh. There was an older gentleman in our church growing up. I love this brother. He was so sweet. He was so encouraging. He was such a good person. He loved Jesus so much. But man, when he prayed, I wanted to leave the room. Because this is how he would pray. Lord God, we asked God in Jesus' name that you, God, would now, God, move, God, in this place, God, by the power of the Spirit, God, touch us, God, fall, God, let your fire fall, God. And after about 10 or 15 gods, the Holy Spirit whispered to me one day and said, I think he knows my name. And it cracked me up. But it was a habit of prayer that he had formed, and there was nothing wrong with it. That's the way he communicated with God. But I want to say this morning, some of you this morning, when you hear the word prayer, you think of things like that. You think of this is what prayer must be, and this is how I'm supposed to pray. So, that being said, there are also false prayer stereotypes. This is how we're not supposed to pray. You don't have to pray in the King James You can pray in the everyday communication. When God speaks to me, I don't hear, now thou wilt go to this place and you will goest as quickly, as hastily as you can. The moment God talks to me like that, I'm going to go see a doctor. Because I know for a a moment there, that's not him. And I'm hearing voices in my head. God doesn't speak to me that way. You know how God talks to me? The way I'm talking to you right now. And I hope God speaks to you the same way. God speaks through his word in whatever translation you have. But when it comes to just everyday vernacular, you don't have to put on airs when you come to God. Rejoice and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Pray without ceasing. Notice that Paul acknowledges there's more than one kind of circumstance. So Paul didn't say, give thanks when it's time to be thankful. Give thanks in November for Thanksgiving. No, Paul says there's going to be various circumstances. Learn to pray and thanks God in all of them. Learn to give thanks to God in all of them. Because you see, in all of these circumstances, we can rejoice, we can pray, we can give thanks to God. And God is not ignorant of our circumstances. He's just above them. God is not ignorant of what you're going through. He's just above it. God has not turned a blind eye and God is not unaware of the part of your life you're going through right now or the season of life that you're in right now. But thankfully, no matter what season I'm in, he's above it and the word says he never changes. So if he never changes, then whether it's a good day, a bad day, a terrible day, an okay day, a sadful day, a joyful day, a terrible day, no matter what day or kind of day it is, I can bring praise and thankfulness in prayer to him. Because I'm not doing it based on what's going on. I'm doing it based on the one who's above it all who has not changed. Are you hearing me today? So real quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because we got to move. And i got to bring this plane in for a landing. But real quick, I just want to have a little fun. And I want to show you some examples of areas in your life where God has given you his word to talk about what is going on, and how you can give thanks to God and pray to God. And in the first situation, of course, is in times of joy. And every single one of these things I'm going to give you, there's multiple places all through the Scripture, but if you want to write these down, great. Put the word joy and put a dash and just quickly put P.S. period and put all these numbers for all the Psalms. P.S. for the Psalm and then write all the numbers down. But anytime you're having a good day, and here's the way I learned it in my, in my elementary first or second grade Sunday school class. J-O-Y. Here's how you have joy. When you have Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. If you keep Jesus first, and then put others second, and then put yourself last, God will give you joy. Yay, all of you have something you can write down. And I promise you it changed my life. Because if I put myself first, I'm looking for what's called happiness. And happiness and joy are not the same thing. Joy, I find when I have him first. Happiness, I find when something good happens. That's where we get the word happiness from. Happiness comes from what happens. So I'm happy because I've had a good happening. Are you with me? 
I'm happy because this just happened. But how many know sometimes bad things happen, even to Christians? You don't believe me? Look at the lives of the 12 disciples. All but one died a martyr's death, and they tried to kill John twice. Sometimes bad things happen to us. But in the days that are full of joy, today's a good day, God. I choose to have joy. David writes about all these things in the scripture. Next one. You can pray and praise God when you're sad. I've done it. It's powerful. Emotions are real. God wants you to feel them. I remember hearing, Jessica knows who I'm talking about. We went to a marriage retreat with a bunch of couples. And one of the the teachers said, here's the cool thing about feelings. Feelings aren't right or wrong. They just are. Feelings are not right or wrong. They just are. We feel things. The trick is, when I feel this, what do I do with it? Are you hearing me? I'm feeling sad right now. So it's not the sadness that's the problem. It's what I choose to do when I am sad. Getting tempted is not a sin. Giving in to the temptation is the sin. Are you hearing me this morning? So when everybody's like, oh God, please forgive me. I was tempted today. So Jesus was too. But the Bible says Jesus made a way of escape where we don't have to give in to our temptation. So when you feel sad, and there's nothing wrong with being sad. Jesus wept. The Bible said that the heart of the Lord has been sad, that the God's heart has been broken before. God knows what sadness is. God created you with emotions to feel this way. So in the midst of them, you can overcome them and live for him in the midst of them. So feel your sadness. But then in the midst of that sadness, go, yet will I praise him. Yet will I still rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. David put it this way in one of these Psalms. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disquieted within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet trust him, my hope and my salvation and my God. So David acknowledged his sadness and said, but why are you downcast? It's okay to be sad and not be downcast. So why are you downcast? Why are you so disquieted? Put your hope in God and praise him. And when David did that, the sadness was there, but the victory was achieved in the midst of it. Are you hearing me this morning? Next one, fear. And yes, for those of you that are watching online, these are all the characters from the Inside Out movie. The sequel's coming out soon, and my kids and I and my wife cannot wait to see it because that movie is so cute. We love it. I saw so much gospel in it because it talks about dealing with life. And in the midst of life, you are supposed to feel these emotions. And sometimes we get afraid. But did you know the Bible says 365 times, one for each day of the year, do not be afraid. So fear will happen, but don't give in to it. There's fear, and then there's being afraid. So there's sad, and then there's giving in to the sadness and letting it turn into depression. Are you hearing me this morning? There's, there's, okay, fear is trying to come in, but quickly, wait, God hasn't given me that spirit of fear. He's given me power, love, and a sound mind. So I choose, as, as God said to Joshua, be strong and be courageous. Do not be afraid, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So I'm not going to give in to the fear. I'm going to feel it, but I'm not going to give in to it. I will choose not to be afraid because I know who my help is. I lift my eyes to the hills from whence my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So this little thing compared to him is nothing. Are you hearing me this morning? Let's move quickly. Anger. There's a verse that says, be angry but sin not. So it's okay to feel angry. Jesus got angry. I promise you when Jesus sat down and made a whip and went into the temple and flipped over the tables, he didn't do it like this. He wasn't happy about it. He was angry. But he chose to not give in to the anger. And he said, it is written, this house is to be a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves. So he was righteous in his anger, and he did not let his anger consume him. And he didn't give in to his temper. And David writes all through the Psalms about being angry. And they're comical, by the way. They are comical. But in that moment, he was angry. Lord, my enemies have formed against me. Do you not see them? Lord, my enemies are coming against me. Would you take their heads off their shoulders? 
I mean, it's, it's comical. It's great. But guess what? Okay, I'm about to set somebody free here right now. Are you ready to be set free? How many are ready to be set free? It's okay to get along with God. Nobody else around you. Please make sure nobody else is around you. But it's okay to get along before God and go, God, I can't stand this. This is not right. This is unfair. This is just wrong. I'm watching the media today. They are blind. There's no truth. All I hear is agenda. These people I've been witnessing to them for years and years and years and still they mock me and they won't come to church and they still ridicule my faith. Where are you doing it? Alone with him. Your, your, your spouse can't handle that. Your kids can't handle that. Your co-workers can't handle that. He can. He'll take it. He'll take it. He'll take it all. Because then at the end of all these psalms, here's what David said. But blessed be your name. Now, Lord, I got that out of my system. Now, blessed be your name. Now, I thank you. Now, I praise you. Give me grace to go through another day. Help me to be, help, forgive me, Lord, for the times I've stepped over the line or said things I shouldn't have said. God, help me to have a good attitude. Help me to pray for those who persecute me. Help me to pray for those who I disagree with. Help me to pray for the president. Help me to pray for the politicians. Help me to pray for the vice president. If you aren't praying for them, you can't criticize them. Are you with me today? If you aren't praying for your enemies, you can't love them. We have to show love and grace through prayer. Are you with me? Finally, real quick, there's some days that are just disgusting. You got laid off. Someone in your family got sick. My son, Nate, has been going through this stomach stuff for about a, a week now. So when y'all see Nate, just kind of take a step back for a second. But sometimes we have just disgusting days where that baby just keeps pooping. Or when someone throws up all over your brand new rug or your brand new piece of furniture. And sometimes days are just disgusting. And same is true in life. Sometimes you're doing all the right things and sometimes somebody just throws up on your life. And sometimes things are just disgusting. And things are just wrong. And things are just unfair. And oh, why do I have to be in this? Why do I have to go through this? In the midst of it, still, he's worthy of praise. Because how many know Jesus went through some disgusting things too? Not very pleasant to get your beard plucked out or get a crown of thorns jammed on your head or get your back whipped. He went through some disgusting things. Jesus went through some terrible, terrible seasons in his life. Before the cross, he went through some hard seasons. In the midst of all those, he got up before God and he led his prayers out to God and let God help him navigate through these things. Finally, as I come in here for a landing this morning, we can't focus on our circumstances. If we do, then our prayer life will be choked out by them. Jesus put it this way. Some seed fell upon the ground, and, and the thorns came up and choked it out. And this represents those who let the worries, the circumstances of this life, crowd out my word in their hearts. We can't allow our circumstances to choke out his word in our lives. We, need to, we can't lean on our emotions or our own mental capacity or our own past experiences. If we put our focus in God in the middle of our circumstances, we can find a place of trust and hope and, a, and that allows us to see our circumstances from his perspective, from who, knowing who he is. I love this story as I'm about to close. Aubrey, would you come? There was a house where this family lived. All of a sudden, this little boy in the upstairs bedroom woke up to see that his door and his hallway were in flames. But thankfully, his dad had taught him the fire drill, so he opened up the window to his room, and he got out, and he was on the edge of his roof. But he was so scared because, of course, he's 10 feet off the ground. And the flames were underneath him, so the flames were coming up over the lip of the roof. And all of a sudden, he heard his dad's voice saying, Son, you got to jump. Son, you got to jump. I'll catch you. You got to jump. And the son, crying hysterically, said, But Daddy, I don't see you. And the father said to his son, It's okay, because I see you. So jump. And of course, he jumped into his father's arms. 
Sometimes faith is doing what you don't see. In our circumstances, a lot of us would cower in fear because the flames and the heat and the circumstances are stronger than the God who's calling to us, come to me. Don't sit in your circumstances and let them overwhelm you. Come to me. Come to me. I can handle the circumstances. I can be your refuge from the circumstances. Are you with me this morning? Finally, no limits to whom we pray. God is limitless. There's nothing my God can't do. There's no circumstance that phases him. There's no worry that overwhelms him. There's nothing that surprises him. He sees it all coming. He knows it's all coming. And when it does come into your life, the Bible says that he that began the work will be faithful to complete it and that God is going to work all these things together for good. Well, it's not good, Pastor David. He ain't done working it yet. God has so many characteristics and attributes In Jeremiah 33, verse 3, the Bible says, the Lord says to his people, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. So everything you have written, I'll tell you, but I'm so great and so limitless, I can even show you things you'd never know. I can even show you things that are hidden, things you would never know, never understand if it weren't for me. I want to put this on the screen real quick and let you see this. There's so many attributes to who God is. If any of you want this slide later for your phone or for your computer or just to print off and have in your room or whatever, I'll gladly send this to you. But God has so many things that define Him. The things that He's good, the things that He's, the things that he's done, the things that He is doing, the things that He has done, the things that He's going to do. God has limitless attributes to who He is. And every one of them is for my moment in my life today. No matter where I am in my life, God has a name for that. Remember that old phrase, there's an app for that? In any circumstance of your life, there's a name for that. I need financial increase. He's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I'm sick in my body. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's my healer. I need to break through and get victory. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's the banner over me. I need peace in my life. He's Jehovah Shalom, the Lord who is my peace. I feel like God is nowhere around me. No, I'm Jehovah Shammah. I am the Lord who is there. And that's just a handful, church. Anything you need, there's a name for that. Anything you need in your life, there's a name for that. There's no limit to who we pray to. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me right now? The Lord is calling you this morning to lay aside every limits of your prayer. I'm I'm thankful for your patience with me. The altar call this morning is simple. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I just want you to take this with you because this is your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I'll be up here if you want me to join with you in prayer about something. If you have a need, you you have a sickness in your body, and you want me to pray for healing for you, If there's something in your life you just want your pastor to agree with you and pray for you, I'll be more than glad to do that. But for this moment right here, right now, I want you to imagine your prayer life as a a bowling lane. I'm bringing it back full circle here. I want you to imagine your prayer life as a bowling lane. Where are the gutters? Where are the areas you're afraid of? Where are the areas you've got guards up? I'm afraid about only praying this much. Well, then maybe your gutter is, maybe your, your, your barrier, your limit is over the time you spend in prayer. And maybe you feel judged by that. Uh, my, my brothers and my sisters, they pray this much to God, but that's hard for me. I only pray this much. Let's take that barrier down. Because God did not put that up for you. Well, Pastor David, maybe it's the other side. Maybe I just have a hard time praying to God when I'm sad. I have a hard time praying to God when I'm angry. Or have a hard time praying to God when I'm disgusted. Or have a hard time praying to God when I'm, when I'm even on the good days, it's like I forget about God. On the good days, it's like I, I did this. I, I, I made this happen. This is all because of me. And I seem to forget to pray and thank God for those days. No matter what that is, let's put that barrier down. And let's pray with, with reckless abandon at all times. And then at the end of that, 
at the end of that bowling lane, all those pins, that's the Father's face. Where you don't look at where the ball's going to go. You look at the pins you're trying to knock down. There's no limit to whom you pray to. Focus on him. Peter started sinking in the water when? When he took his eyes off the master. When did Samson give in to temptation? When he forgot who had called him in the first place. When did Peter deny Jesus? When he forgot who Jesus truly was to him and he cared more about his own life than the one who had called him. And he denied Jesus. If you take your eyes off the master, if you take your eyes off the one to whom you pray, you'll start looking at the gutters. And you'll start wanting to put those barriers back up. And God wants your prayer life this morning to have no limits. No limits. So right here, right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm not going to embarrass you, but just a little motion. If either one of those things speaks to you right now, Pastor David, will you just pray for me? Just gently lift your hand. Pastor David, would you pray for me? Just gently lift your hand. I'm not going to make you get up. Just gently lift your hand. I want to grow in my prayer. I don't want my prayer life to have any more limits. I want to have a limitless prayer life so God can unlock the full potential of my prayers to Him. Anybody else? I saw a couple of hands. Anybody else? Pastor David, would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? I want my prayer life to have no limits. Would you pray for me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. And right now, Lord, I've lifted my hands and I just spread them over my people and I spread them towards those watching online right now. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that you would lower the guards in our lives. That, God, we would focus on you and focus on our relationship with you and let that be the basis for when we pray. So, God, any moment of the day, we can pray. We don't have to wait till Wednesday night or wait till Sunday morning. We don't have to wait till we get home. We don't have to wait till the next morning when we're in our prayer time or whatever time it is. We can pray anywhere, anytime. Anywhere, anytime, we can be in an attitude and reception of prayer without ceasing before you, as Paul told us to in 1 Thessalonians. And Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that, Lord, on the best days, on the worst days, on the days they're afraid, on the days that we're sad, on the days that we're joyful, on the days we're disgusted, on the days we may be angry, the Lord, in the midst of those moments, we let those feelings be, but then we immediately turn to you. We immediately turn and lift up your name and glorify your name and seek your face. And we don't live in the anger. We don't live in the fear. We don't live in the joy. We don't live in the sadness. We don't live in the disgustedness, God. We run to you with all of these things. And Lord, if we're joyful, we say thank you for what you're doing. If we're sad, we say thank you, God, that we can come to you when we're sad. If we're disgusted, we come to you and say thank you, God, that you hold all things. If we're angry, we go, thank you, Lord, you're a God of justice and you see what's going on. And Lord, when we're fearful, we come to you knowing that you are our help and our refuge in our times of need. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name that there's no limits on you. I'm thankful, Lord, in Jesus' name there's no time and no place and no season we can't run to you in prayer. And so, Lord, right now, everyone in the sound of my voice and everybody watching online, I pray that that becomes so clear to them and awaken them, God, that, Lord, their daily life is no longer measured by how many minutes they pray, but it's now measured by how closer they get to you when they pray. In Jesus' name, grow us in our prayer life. Those of us that are baptized in the Holy Spirit and have a prayer language, I pray, Lord, you would develop that. Grow the vocabulary of that unknown precious language. Let us begin to pray in the Spirit as often as we can, God. Lord, when we're angry, we turn and pray in the Spirit. When we're wounded, we pray in the Spirit. When we're afraid, we pray in the Spirit. We pray in that unknown language that not even the enemy knows because then that's a weapon we can use to overcome what we're feeling in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. We've got to get ready to dismiss here in just a second. But if anybody here needs prayer for anything, for anything at all, sickness, worry, anxiety, and you want to meet me up here for prayer, I'm going to be up here as soon as we dismiss, and I want you to come and join me. I'll be more than happy to agree with you and just pray over you a blessing or pray over you whatever you need. But in this moment, Jessica, if you wouldn't mind, go into the prayer playlist and, um, you know what, actually, let me do it from here. Let me do it from here. 
me do from here? Just watch the volume on this because there's something we need to do before we dismiss. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. So in a minute before we dismiss and we give room to pray for everybody needs to pray, Christy, would you please bring the gift forward? Come here, Miss Aubrey. Today's a bittersweet day. For those of you that may not know, Miss Aubrey Decker here is about to graduate from ASU in a month. And she's about to embark in this brand new season of her life. And she's going to be going into different areas of of career, different areas of brand building, different areas of things that God has laid on her heart to start doing. And as a result of that, she can only juggle so many balls and do so many plates and have so many things happening in her life at one time. And so to completely focus on where God's taking her, um, one of the things that she's going to have to give up is doing our music here. When I first got here last year, I immediately walked in and felt such a calmness and a peace of the Spirit of God in this place that only comes from people that know how to worship and know how to pray. And she's a huge part of that. I told her this this morning before you guys got here, that I am such a huge fan of hers because she loves the Lord and because God has a deep plan for her life. Music will always be a part of it in some way, shape, or form, but God's called her to bigger things and doing great things in her and through her. So Aubrey, we just want to give you this as a sign of appreciation. She's pretty on the outside, but her heart is beautiful like these flowers on the inside. And God has such a sweet spirit in her. And God's got big plans for her life. So today will be her last day here. And she has plowed the ground and she's walked this stage and prayed for future musicians and vocalists. And God is going to send them here because her prayers will not go unanswered by him. And we believe with all our heart, no matter what she does and puts her hands to, she will succeed in the biggest way because everything she does she dedicates it to the Lord. So right now, would you stand with me? And we're just going to stretch our hands toward Miss Aubrey as a sign of thankfulness, but also as a sign of blessing. And we just say, Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this lovely young lady. We thank you, Lord, for this woman of God. That, Lord, at a young age, you're already using her to build your kingdom. And, Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that, Lord, as she goes out to accomplish the things you're calling her to do, that, God, you would go with her in the strongest way possible. Lord, I pray she is a disruptor in the kingdom. Lord, I pray she goes into areas where darkness reigns, and she brings the light. She brings disruption. Lord, whatever she puts her hands to, whether it's in social media, whether it's in brand building, whether it's in teaching, or whether it's in music ministry, God, but whatever she lays her hands to that you're calling her to put her hands on, that, God, you would use her to bring forth the light of God, to bring forth the power of God into that circumstance. And Lord, we are thankful, God, for all the work she's done here. We're thankful, God, for all the things she's done in bringing her to this place and bringing our campus to this place. Lord, we thank we thank you, God, for the seeds that have been sown, the works that have been done. And we pray, God, every seed that's been planted and everything that's been done, every word that's been said, Lord, that you would bring it to fulfillment, that the harvest would come from her labors, God, that Jesus, she has been sowing and sowing. And Lord, we're believing, God, for signs and wonders and souls to come and musicians to come and vocals to come come and take people to come, God, from all the things that she's prayed and all the things that she's done. And Lord, wherever she goes, may your blessing go with her. May your presence go with her. Greatness go with her. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give her a hand clap of appreciation? Thank you, Aubrey. We love you. We love you. Thank you so much. If any of you want to hug her or bless her after service, please feel free to do that. I'm going to be right over here. If anybody has a need they want me to pray with them about, we'll be more than happy to do that as well. But God bless you. Be blessed as you go. I pray, God, your prayer life would only increase. And now.